MTG spitting fire at a reporter up on Capitol Hill, and we love to see that. We're going to show you every single day. She drops a couple of bad words, too, and we like that. Representative Matt Gates just called out Merrick Garland to his face under oath. That happened like 30 minutes ago. You're going to see that video as well. Donald Trump is on TikTok, and whether you think that's a good idea or not, he is blowing Joe Biden away when it comes to engagement and followers. It's not even close. We're going to get to all of that and a whole lot more. We're brought to you by the Electronic Payments Coalition. Love those guys. I'm Larry O'Connor. You can call me Larry. We have a ton to get to, so I just want to quickly ask you to like and subscribe this video if you can. Uh, uh, make sure it's in your regular routine so you catch our show every single day. Engagement is kicking butt right now. We're thrilled that you've been able to launch this show up to the level that it is already. And just like we started this in October for crying out loud, and uh, we're having a blast doing it. But we got an election to win and we got to get the message out to people about how important it is and what the truth is. And we think we present it in such a way that is really engaging for a lot of voters who maybe haven't made up their decision or not. Well, let us help them make the decision. And we can do that if you like, if you subscribe, if you share this video on your social media. It makes a huge difference, and we really appreciate it. All right, yesterday on Capitol Hill, we showed you this video when Marjorie Taylor Greene called out Anthony Fauci to his face. Remember this moment? You know that what this committee should be doing? We should be recommending you to be prosecuted. We should be writing a criminal referral because you should be cr prosecuted for crimes against humanity. You belong in prison, Dr. Fauci. Mr. Chairman. That's right. And, and, and what did they got to complain about it? She called him doctor, right? That was the big argument yesterday from Democrats. As she lists off all of the things that he did to destroy people's lives. And they said, you better call him doctor. Don't call him Mr. Fauci. He's a doctor. All right, well, there you go. You should be in jail, doctor. So Marjorie Taylor Greene left that hearing, walked outside to the corridor. And then Anthony Fauci's goon squad, his defenders, his PR people, they were there to defend him and go after Marjorie Taylor Greene. Of course, I'm referring to reporters. I'm referring to journalists. They're his defenders. They're his PR squad. And, well, let's just say it didn't go well for the reporter. No, absolutely not. I mean, everything I said is correct. It's how the American people feel. It's what we know to be a fact. It's all the evidence uh, has been proven true. We have Jamie Raskin in there accusing us of worshiping Trump. Worshiping as a convicted felon. Well, well, yes, yeah, so is George Floyd. And everybody, and you all too, the media worship George Floyd. Democrats worship George Floyd. There were riots burning down the country over George Floyd and Raskin's and they're saying we worship him. Excuse me, let me correct you. And this is really important. I don't worship, I worship God. God and Jesus is my savior. I don't worship President Trump. And I'm really sick and tired of the bullshit annex I have to deal with constantly from the Democrats. So that's what we just went through in there. And then they're sitting there. They can attack my character all day long. Uh, what's his face in there? Whoever was talking last was calling me insane. But yet we can't say, oh, they're they're attacking my character. Oh, no, it's nonstop BS and annex. You want to know why? The Democrats don't have anything. They're responsible for the lockdowns, forced vaccinations, kids being forced to stay home, people committing suicide, and all the horrors that this country lived through during COVID. Fauci belongs in prison. He should be tried for mass murder and he should be tried for crimes against humanity. That's how I feel after that hearing. That's how the American people feel. All righty then. We're going to do a Larry on this. We're going to break it down piece by piece. And usually when we do this to a clip, we show you everything that's wrong with what either the reporter or the politician just said. We're going to reverse that trend. We're going to show you everything that's right about this. And listen, I get it. A lot of you might not like Marjorie Taylor Greene. You think she's rough around the edges. Her presentation style might not be the same as yours. Maybe you don't come from the same part of the country that she comes from. Maybe her style doesn't actually appeal to where you live regionally or culturally. You know, so what? Here's what I like about Marjorie Taylor Greene. She unabashedly, unreservedly, and unapologetically represents her voters in her district the way they want to be represented. And that's the job. And she does it well. And I don't always agree with her. But I do like that she has no more to give for anyone.
All right. So uh, let's start at the beginning here as the reporter confronts her about what she had just done in there, which is to lay out what Marjorie Taylor Greene believes were crimes that Anthony Fauci was a participant in. In that room? No, absolutely not. I mean, everything I said is correct. It's how the American people feel. It's what we know to be a fact. It's all the evidence uh, has been proven true. We have Jamie Raskin in there accusing us of worshiping Trump, worshiping as a convicted felon. He is a convicted well, well, yeah, so is George. Do you like that? Do you like the journalist jumping? Well, he is a convicted felon. He is a convicted felon. They just they can't get enough of that. It's the most important thing. Yeah, that's the convicted felon who raised $75 million in a 48-hour period. And now I'm told, and that's all in small dollar donations. And I'm told, all told, it was over $300 million over the course of the four days through the weekend. Yeah, that convicted, oh boy, the idea that Donald Trump is a convicted felon is really repelling people right now. Uh, but but that's fine. She makes a very important point here about worshiping. George Floyd and everybody, and you all too, the media worship George Floyd. Democrats worship George Floyd. There were riots burning down the country over George Floyd and Raskins, and they're saying we worship him. Yeah, oh, well, and of course, how dare you say that? How dare you say that? We do not worship George Floyd. That is an outrageous thing to say. Nobody here is worshiping George Floyd. That 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 is a real thing. That was not created in any level of irony or anything that's real and if you go to every major city in america you see something similar to this downtown usually near martin luther king boulevard or malcolm x boulevard sometimes at the intersection of those two streets you'll see a street mural of george floyd if it's not like this it's something similar i've seen one where george floyd has giant angel wings which, by the way, is theologically incorrect. Human beings who die don't become angels. It's a wonderful life aside. That's just bad theology. But yes, they worship George Floyd. Of course they worship George Floyd. But let's get back to Marjorie Taylor Greene, because this isn't even about George Floyd. This is about Anthony Fauci. They're saying we worship him. Excuse me, let me correct you, and this is really important. I don't worship, I worship God. God, and Jesus is my savior. I don't worship President Trump, and I'm really sick and tired of the bullshit annex I have to deal with constantly from the Democrats. Yeah, and this is an important point. If you watch that hearing or any portions of the hearing, there were, if I may, bull <laughs> antics on both sides. The difference is when Marjorie Taylor Greene pulls antics, she does it in regular English and like a normal human being, like you're seeing right now. She acts and reacts like a typical person in a situation like this would act. People like Jamie Raskin and Debbie Dingbad and, and all of the other Democrat, Kwesi and Fume, they all talk legislative speak. They say, oh, just point of order, please, sir. Point of personal privilege. I, I have a call, call to order here on a personal point of privilege and personal uh, rules and regulations here on the protocols involved in speaking of it. But that's bullshit. And oh, I forgot to bleep it. Those are antics, too. The difference is they don't talk like regular human beings. They talk like legislative AI chat GPT robots. But they hold up proceedings. They start blocking people from their testimony. They're deflecting. They're deferring. Or as SMQB in our chat says, Eric Swalwell interrupts everything and asks if they could get some Chinese. Because it's been a long time since he's eaten Chinese. So it's good for, again, you may not like Marjorie Taylor Greene, but she talks like a human being. She's not some bot up there. And it's real. It's raw. Sometimes it's great and effective. Sometimes it's cringe. In this case, it's real because it's like everybody forgot what happened during COVID and the pandemic and the Fauci was the center of it all. It's like every guy, everyone's got collective amnesia. Why is not every single election right now a referendum on the incumbent's behavior during the pandemic? Every single election, but nobody wants to talk about it anymore. The single most disruptive thing in our lives for the last 150 years, and it was completely government caused. Either the government of communist China causing it with the release of the virus 
or our government's reaction to it because we listen to people like Anthony Fauci, the little midget autocratic tyrant who forced businesses to be shut down, forced schools to be closed, and forced our election to be upended. All based on a protocol of six feet distancing that now they have no idea where it came from. So she's real about this because she feels it. Why doesn't everyone else? Okay. So that's what we just went through in there. And then they're sitting there. They can attack my character all day long. Uh, what's his face in there? Whoever was talking last was calling me insane. But yet we can't say, oh, they're they're attacking my character. Oh, no, it's nonstop BS and annex. You want to know why? The Democrats don't have anything. They're responsible for the lockdowns, forced vaccinations, kids being forced to stay home, people committing suicide, and all the horrors that this country lived through during COVID. Fauci belongs in prison. He should be tried for mass murder, and he should be tried for crimes against humanity. That's how I feel after that hearing. That's how the American people feel. And she's right. And she's and she's right. And she's demonstrating it. And and I again, I question why other people don't. But back to the worshiping thing, because she did make a good point. You know, they worship George Floyd. He's also a convicted felon, by the way, his felons a lot more serious than, you know, falsifying financial records for a nondisclosure agreement. But Democrats have now responded. They said, how dare you? That is outrageous. We do not worship George Floyd. We have never worshiped George Floyd. Get it right. We only worship one person and one person only, Anthony Fauci. That's who we worship. How dare you? How dare you, madam, tell us that we worship anybody other than the one true God, the sainted Anthony Fauci. And that really is the topic of the hearing anyway. So do you remember these candles? We actually have one in my radio studio. In D.C., we keep one in the uh, in the studio on the desk just so we can all remember what we went through during the pandemic. Do you have one of these? You don't? We do. We do at our studio. Uh, you know who else has one of them? Anthony Fauci. Here. Zoom in here. Take a look right there over his shoulder. While he's doing a media hit from his office, he makes sure that everyone can see his Anthony Fauci candles that he keeps of himself on his shelf. Hat tip to Ian Miles Chung, I think, was the first person to find that. And Tim Poole, I remembered on one of his shows, he uh, he featured that. Also, by the way, over here, Ohio State, that figures. Yeah, you see, the, de the left, the Democrats, they worship the right kind of people. Anthony Fauci. And even Anthony Fauci worships Anthony Fauci. In fact, I'm sure you'll remember this clip from his documentary where Anthony Fauci is in his office surrounded by pictures of Anthony Fauci while he watches on his computer screen the exact same clip that we're looking at this moment. So it's Fauci surrounded by pictures of Anthony Fauci watching a video of Fauci surrounded by pictures of Anthony Fauci, watching a video of Fauci. That This is like an Escher print, you know, where the ants are going down the stairs, like a Mobius strip or something. It's geometry. Look it up. Thank you, Marjorie Taylor Greene. We appreciate you calling them on their, um, on their bullshit. Thank you. Listen, have you asked yourself recently, can your savings weather an economic storm? Well, if you haven't asked that question, I'm going to ask it. Can your savings weather an economic storm? Yeah. Think about where you've put your money right now for the future. <clears throat> Inflation can render cash worthless. Real estate can crash like it did in 2008. Economies built on a mountain of debt like we're racking up right now in D.C. can fall like a house of cards. There are very few physical assets you can invest in that can stand the test of time. Gold, however, has withstood as a valued form of money for millennia. It's why people are flocking to it now. And it's why Birch Gold is busier than ever. Through a little-known tax loophole, Birch Gold lets you convert a retirement account into a tax-sheltered IRA in physical gold. And the best part is it doesn't cost you a penny out of pocket because this is an existing account you've got that you're converting. 
Now, to learn more about this, just text my name, Larry, to 989898. That's L-A-R-R-Y to 989898. Get yourself a free info kit on gold. Let me ask you again. Can your IRA or 401k weather an economic storm? And if not, call the people I trust. It's Birch Gold. Text Larry to 989898 and secure your savings today. All right. Also in the hearings yesterday, we had a great moment where uh, Congressman Rich McCormick had some questions for Anthony Fauci. Now, who is Rich McCormick? Rich McCormick is a congressman from Georgia. Rich McCormick is a United States Marine. He's also a veteran of the United States Navy, where he served as a, a corpsman, as a doctor. In fact, he is still a doctor. In fact, when he's not in Congress, uh, Commander Congressman McCormick uh, serves as a physician at an emergency room in Georgia. During the pandemic, he treated patients of COVID, something Anthony Fauci never did. And so Dr. Commander Congressman McCormick had some very interesting questions for Anthony Fauci. Why would I be criticized by a bureaucrat for doing my very best as a healthcare? This is a rhetorical question. But why? Why would the government, who has never treated a patient for COVID, you can read all the things you want, but you're not there. You're not seeing patients. You're not watching people die, intubating patients right there with that disease in your face, watching it happen, watching the development of this disease and actually learning from it. But I'm being told by bureaucrats what's right and wrong. And what's funny is everything I was censored on, I was proven to be right. Pretty crazy, isn't it? You said in an interview that you gave as part of an audiobook written by Michael Spector. We're going to let this finish because it gets really, really good. But I want to make sure that that little comment that the doctor made didn't go by unnoticed. Did you hear what he said? Why would I be censored? I'm a doctor working in the trenches treating COVID patients. He got censored. He voiced his opinion, his disapproval with the policies coming out of Washington, D.C. He is a medical doctor. He is a physician. He was actually treating these patients. They censored him on social media. There was actually an attempt in Georgia to try to strip him of his license. Why? What was his crime? He disagreed with Anthony Fauci. Remember the good old days in America when you were being treated by a doctor and if something serious was wrong, you would get a second opinion? With Anthony Fauci and the totalitarians at the CDC and the NIH and any other state agency outside of the federal government that dictated health policies, there was no such thing as a second opinion. And all of this was backed up and enforced by the muscle of the mainstream media. Don't forget that. Don't forget it at one moment. They were the muscle behind all of this. And it was outrageous. All right. But now, uh, Mr. McCormick, I love it when congressmen bring receipts. And he's got audio of Fauci from an interview he gave. Take a look. You believed an institutional should make it hard for people to, to live their lives it, so they'd feel pressured to get vaccinated. Could we re, re, uh, run the audio clip on that, please? Do you think can be done about it? I have to say that I don't see a big solution other than some sort of mandatory vaccination. I know federal officials don't like to use that term. Once people feel empowered and protected legally, you are gonna have schools, universities, and colleges are going to say, you want to come to this college, buddy? You're going to get vaccinated. Lady, you're going to get vaccinated. Yeah. Big corporations like Amazon and Facebook and, and, and all of those others are going to say, you want to work for us? You get vaccinated. And it's been proven that when you make it difficult for people in their lives, they lose their ideological bullshit and they get vaccinated. All right. Now, that was the audio from Anthony Fauci in this interview. And, and real fast before we get the reaction, if you close your eyes, if you squint a little bit even and listen to that with the Brooklyn accent, you know, and sort of the scratchy audio, doesn't it sound like an FBI wiretap of a mobster talking to his capos about what they're going to do, you know, breaking people's kneecaps with lead pipes if they don't come along and comply? That's what this guy sounds like. He's a little mobster. You want your work. You want you want your kids go to go to school. You want to have a job. You want to go out and go to a store. You better get vaccinated. You hear me, boy? 
That's Anthony Fauci. That's the real Anthony Fauci. What you saw yesterday, the befuddled old absent-minded professor who's just so kindly, and oh, oh, no, 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 I didn't mean that. You're misunderstanding. No, 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 please take a look at the full record. I always said this. I always kept an open mind about things. You know, you're mischaracterizing everything I did. That's not the real Anthony Fauci. That was a, that was a game you saw yesterday. That was somebody cosplaying a kindly old Italian dude. No, no, no. What you just heard was Fauci. They're going to drop their ideological shit, and they're going to get vaccinated, or else they'll get kicked out of society. And I want to remind you that every single federal employee, including Anthony Fauci, they take an oath. And their oath is not to cram their policies down the American people's throats against their will. Their oath is to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. But Anthony Fauci, he paid no attention. He doesn't care. He has a higher calling. And it's not medicine. It's not public health. His higher calling is Anthony Fauci's power. So take it away, Congressman McCormick. Thank you. Are all objections to COVID vaccinations ideological bullshit, Dr. Fauci? No, they're not. And that's Thank you. not what I was referring to. Well, in reference to making it hard for people to get education, traveling, working, I'd say it very much was in context. And I take great offense to this. Miss Allison Williams testified before this committee about losing her job because she sought an exemption for ESPN's vaccine mandate, which came from recommendations from bureaucrats like yourself. She and her husband were actively working with a fertility expert, a physician, on how to get pregnant and agreed with the premise that she was young, healthy, wanted to get pregnant, and shouldn't get the vaccination for medical purposes. But she was fired because you made it hard, just like you said in your statement, because you didn't want to make sure that the ideological bullshit got in the way of her working, of living her life, of making a medical decision with her healthcare professional. I think America should take great offense to this. That's exactly what you meant when you said making it hard for people to live without getting a vaccination. You affected people's ability to work, travel, be educated, to actually flourish in American society, to self-determine as we're all given God-given rights. Shame on you. Dr. Fauci, you've become Dr. Fear. Americans do not hate science. I don't hate science. The American people hate having their freedoms taken from them. You inspired and created fear through mass mandates, school closures, vaccine mandates that have destroyed the American people's trust in our public health institutions. This fear you created will continue to have ripple effects over generations to come. You have already seen its effects in education, in the economy, and everything else. Quite frankly, you said, if you, agree, if you disagree with me, you disagree with science. Dr. Fauci, I disagree with you because I disagree with fear. And with that, I yield. Uh, great job by the congressman out of Georgia. Now, he wasn't the only one who did a very good job yesterday. We also have Congressman Mike Cloud from Texas. Uh, this is a great summary of basically everything that Anthony Fauci said yesterday under questioning. There's a lot of noise and a lot of distraction stuff. But when you boil it down, Anthony Fauci doubled down on every single failed policy that he is responsible for, yet at the same time tried to deflect and make it appear as though he wasn't directly responsible for any of them. It's a hell of an act. And here's the thing. He's been working in the federal government since the 80s. This is his skill set. Not virology, not immunization, not public health policy. His skill set is figuring out how to navigate through the federal government bureaucracies and legislative bodies by constantly getting accolades and applause and credit for stuff he doesn't do and deflecting blame for the stuff that he's ruined. That's the recipe for success in government work. And this is a perfect example of how he achieved it. Uh, I, I'm going to go through a list of COVID mitigation measures that you supported over the course of the pandemic and ask you to give me a yes or no as to whether you believe these measures were justified. Business closures? Early on when 5,000 people were dying a day, yes. Church closures? Same thing. School closures? Again. The Stay-at-home orders? 
These were important when we were trying to stop the tsunami of deaths that were occurring early on. Er How early long on. you kept them going is debatable. Mass mandates for adults, mass mandates for children, mass mandates for children under five. And going back to what I said before, all of that is in the context of at the time, four mass to five thousand for children people under five. A day there's were scientific dying. evidence for that. Excuse me. Mass mandates for children under five. There's scientific evidence supporting that. There was no study that did masks on kids before. You couldn't do the study. You had to respond right. to an epidemic that was killing four to five thousand Americans. Per vaccine day. mandates for employees. Vaccine mm -hmm. mandates for students. Vaccine mandates for military. Vaccines save lives. It is very, very clear that vaccines have saved hundreds of thousands of Americans and millions. I, I'm not debating. Of We're talking about worldwide. the COVID-19. Uh, did or do the vaccines, the COVID-19 vaccines, stop anyone from getting COVID? I have answered that question to the chairman. Early on, it became clear that they did. No, actually, no. In the beginning, it clearly prevented infection in a certain percentage of people, but the durability of its ability to prevent infection was not long. It was measured in months. And they didn't stop you from spreading it either. Early right. on, it did if it prevented infection. But what became clear that it did not prevent transmission when the ability to prevent infection I, waned. I, I, I th so he's a really a doctor in cover your that that's what he holds a license in, and and I gotta say he's probably the best in the federal government of doing so. I mean, you gotta admire it. You gotta admire the audacious nature of it, and his ability to cover his <laughs> as he lies through his teeth and deflects any blame for anything. And and when you start to challenge any of the policies, the only response is, well, we had four or five thousand people dying a day, so of course it was a good thing to do. I mean, it's like saying, you know, um, as soon as we had four or 5,000 people dying a day, you know, it became clear that we had to outlaw anybody driving in a car anywhere in America. We just had to. Um, but Dr. Fauci, there was no scientific basis for that. And keeping people from driving in their car anywhere they wanted to go had absolutely no bearing on whether the virus spread, anybody caught the virus, or anybody had any health ramifications from the virus. The two don't have anything to do with one another. Well, yes, but people were dying. What do you expect us to do? Oh, sure, after the fact, if you're a Monday morning quarterback, you could actually question our motives, but at the time, we did what we thought was best. And there you have it. All done, everyone. Wash your hands of it. Let's just move on from COVID-19, okay? Although we do want to keep all of the protocols we put in place for mail-in ballots and drop-off boxes and all that. Well, we got to keep that, you know, just in case. Out of an abundance of caution. Please, Donald Trump, please promise that on your first day, you will create a full-blown, transparent investigation of everything at the CDC and the NIH and at the state level, every governor's decision-making process, who informed them, who advised them, who was in the room challenging those decisions. And Mr. Trump, you might not come out looking great. It may show that you actually wrongly believed people who you may have thought were right, but they were wrong and they were screwing you over. And you might not like that, Mr. Trump, but I'm telling you, sir, you will be a hero because it won't make you look good, because you will have to humbly stand up and say, I got this wrong, too, because I listen to these idiots. But you have to understand how powerful that would be and how healing it would be, how cleansing it would be. And believe it or not, if we actually put some changes into effect for the future, the American people will actually gain trust again in our public health agencies, something we don't have anymore. We just don't. Millions of Americans earn and use credit card rewards. They love them. I know I do. I love them. Corporate megastores want to take those rewards away. That ticks me off. Keep your hands off my rewards, guys. These are rewards that we use on groceries and school supplies, cash back to save on gas and grow our small businesses, travel miles we use to make memories. It's called the Durbin Marshall credit card bill. It sucks. And it's going to eliminate credit card rewards. 
No more travel miles, no more cash back, no more hotel points, no more nothing. When lawmakers help corporate megastores line their pockets, American families pay for it. So I want you to tell your senator, please, to oppose the Durbin Marshall credit card bill. This doesn't take a lot. Just go to handsoffmyrewards.com, find out who your senator is, click a couple of buttons, you're going to send the message. That's handsoffmyrewards.com, handsoffmyrewards.com. There was a little bit of acting there. I'm not going to lie. It's been a while. I played Tevia in Fiddler on the Roof my senior year in high school. That was good. Really good. All right, today on Capitol Hill, Merrick Garland, he's the attorney general, you know. I just pause for a minute here. And Mitch McConnell, I mean, I've had some criticisms of Mitch McConnell, but if that guy did anything that we should applaud him for, it was in 2012, when, or excuse me, in 2016, he refused to bring the nomination of Merrick Garland to the Supreme Court up for a committee hearing. And he took so much crap from people in Washington, D.C. It was an outrage. This is, you can't do this. We're, you're going to leave it up to the presidential. First of all, it helped Trump get elected because we had an open seat on the Supreme Court. And so even people who weren't on board with Trump 100%, they had a choice in front of them. The next president's going to nominate the person to fill that seat. Do you want it to be Hillary Clinton doing the nominating? Or do you want to roll the dice with Donald Trump? Well, that was one of the reasons Trump won. Mitch McConnell kept Merrick Garland off the Supreme Court, not only helping Trump win, but he also saved our nation because this Merrick Garland guy is a nightmare. He is an egotistical, narcissistic megalomaniac who is now trying to wreak revenge against Donald Trump for that. So he's on Capitol Hill. Matt Gates of Florida has some simple questions for him because, you know, there's a lot of people out there in the media and Democrats who are accusing us Republicans of being conspiracy theorists, because we think, I know, listen to this, because this is a really wild, whacked out theory that we've got. But we think, and we uh, promulgate this idea, that the prosecutions against Donald Trump, the one in Manhattan that just happened, the one that's going on down in Fulton County with the district attorney there, Fannie Willis, that those are actually coordinated by Democrats and specifically by people in the Biden White House or in the Biden administration. I know it seems like a completely whacked out conspiracy theory. Where's my tinfoil hat? I'm going to rip off my shirt and start screaming like Alex Jones. But that's what some of us believe. And Matt Gates, he wants to get to the bottom of this. <clears throat> Attorney General, you've told us that it's a dangerous conspiracy theory to allege that the Department of Justice is communicating with these state and local prosecutions against Trump. You can clear it all up for us right now. Will the Department of Justice provide to the committee all documents, all correspondence between the department and Alvin Bragg's office and Fonnie Willis's office and Letitia James's office? The offices you're referring to are independent offices of state. I get of, that. I get that. State. The question is whether or not you will provide all of your documents and correspondence. That's the question. It's, I, I don't need a, a history lesson. Well, I'm going to say again. We do not control those offices. They make yeah, their the own decisions. The question is whether you communicate with them, not whether you control them. Do you communicate with them and will you provide those communications? If you make a request, we'll refer it to our Office of Legislative but, but Affairs. But see, here's the thing. They you come in here and you lodge this attack that it's a conspiracy theory that there is coordinated lawfare against Trump. And then when we say, fine, just give us the documents, give us the correspondence, and then if it's a conspiracy theory, that will be evident. But when you say, well, we'll take your request and then we'll, we'll sort of work it through the DOJ's accommodation process, then you're actually advancing the very dangerous conspiracy theory that you're concerned about. Now, you're, you were a judge, once nominated the highest court in our country. When you were a judge, I'm just curious, did you ever make political donations to partisan candidates? No. No, and, and you didn't because that would create the potential appear, appearance of impropriety. I didn't because there's a federal rule oh. barring federal judges from making contributions. Right, but, but under that same theory of attacks on the judicial process, like shouldn't someone be owed like a jury of their peers and a judge that's non-biased rather than getting a judge from your political opponent's donor file? 
I'm well aware that you're not asking a hypothetical. You're asking me to comment on a verdict, jury verdict in a, another jurisdiction which has to be respected. I won't comment on it. That case is still ongoing. The def- all right, all right. This is really, really good stuff. And, I, and again, I get it. Just like Marjorie Taylor Greene earlier in the program, Matt Gates rubs some people the wrong way. They don't always like his style. They don't always like his approach. Neither do I. By the way, listen, we come from different parts of the country, different worlds, different worldviews, different cultures. But to the point, he is hammering home something so incredibly important and undeniable that it has to be applauded. Because understand what Merrick Garland is doing here. These slimy, slippery, deceitful, obsequious little bastards. Sorry, Kevin. He gets up there and gives this big statement about how dangerous it is for people to suggest some conspiracy theory that lawfare is being used and the judicial system is being used as a weapon against Donald Trump when all we've got is a pure case of law and order and the system working properly. By the way, I'd love for him to say that about George Floyd. Or, or, or about the events in Ferguson, or about, you know, a- any of the race riots we've seen for the last 10 years in this country. You don't hear Merrick Garland saying, listen, the system worked. We have a judicial system. It's about law and order. It's about right and wrong, right? No, there they'll convince you that our entire judicial system is corrupted and broken. But in this one case, finally, they found the pure trial. No, there's no political bias here at all. So Garland gets up there and he gives this statement which is obviously reacting to and commenting on the outrageous Alvin Bragg prosecution of Donald Trump in a jurisdiction that went 89% for Joe Biden with a judge who contributed to Joe Biden against most judicial ethics protocols. Merrick Garland makes this case that, yeah, it's dangerous to float these conspiracy theories. You're undermining the system of justice in our country. And then when asked questions about it, he says, I'm not going to comment on that. I'd, that would be inappropriate for me as attorney general to comment on an ongoing prosecution in another jurisdiction. You mother <laughs> I'm saying a lot of bad words today. You you just went up there and grandstand and calling everybody a hysterical conspiracy theorist, and you were obviously taking the side of the judge and the prosecution and the jury in this case, and then when challenged on it, I can't possibly say anything about that. That would be absolutely inappropriate, but I will dictate the historical relevance of separate jurisdictions, district attorneys, and attorneys general from the federal government. It all started when Senator Hamilton with James Madison went to Philadelphia in the Constitutional Convention. Now, on day one, this was the discussion. Oh, I'm sorry, your time is up. I've got to go back to DOJ now. Actually, no, I'm going to go back into my tree and make some more cookies with my fellow Keebler elves. It was a gratuitous attack on this man's diminutive status, and I apologize for nothing. So that's what he does. He goes out there, he comments on the trial in on his terms, and he gets to throw out his propaganda. And then when challenged on it, I'm not going to comment on that. that Mr. Attorney indicated. General, I hadn't asked you about the verdict yet. We were getting there. I was I was talking about the judge. And so, so let me ask you this question about your time as, as a judge. Was there ever a time when you were a judge when you had a family member who was personally profiting off of the notoriety of a case that, that was before your court. I'm going to say again, it's very clear you're asking me to comment on a case in another jurisdiction. No, no, no. Wait, hold on, hold on, Mr. Attorney General. Did you ever have a family member profit off of the notoriety of any case that you sat over? I'm say again, you're asking, yes or no? me, you're asking me to comment on a case currently. Well, it seems you're connecting the dots, court. Mr. Attorney General. I'm just asking you as to a general principle, but you are aware that Judge Mershon's daughter was profiting off of this prosecution. You are aware that that creates the appearance of impropriety. You know the very reason there's a federal rule against judges giving donations is because it is the very attack on the judicial process that we're concerned about. That, by the way, in case you missed it, was freaking brilliant. Matt Gates asking hypotheticals about whether a judge in a presiding case should make political donations, especially if it's relevant to 
a person that he's actually overseeing in the trial, if it's appropriate for a family member of that judge to profit off the notoriety of the case. Merrick Garland immediately says, well, I'm not going to comment on the Trump case. And Matt Gates says, who's talking about the Trump case? Oh, I'm sorry. So you are aware of this. So so you think that there's a problem. You're just not going to comment on it. I'm, I'm out here talking about broader ethics and principles. You immediately hone in on the Trump case. Thank you. I think you've proven our point. Go back to your tree. Make your cookies. I'm sorry. I don't agree with anything you just said, but I'm not going to comment on it. Okay, on so you won't comment on it, Mr. Court. Attorney General, but you had no problem dispatching Matthew Colangelo. Who's Matthew Colangelo? That is false. I did not dispatch Matthew Colangelo. Matthew That's Colangelo. False. Matthew false. Colangelo became the assistant attorney general at the very beginning of the Biden administration without having been Senate confirmed, goes and gets the senior role at the DOJ. And then after, I believe it's uh, uh, Gupta replaces Colangelo, Colangelo makes this remarkable downstream career journey from the U.S. Department of Justice in Washington, D.C., and then pops up in Alvin Bragg's office to go get Trump. And you're saying that's just a, that's just a career choice that was made that has nothing to do with the lawfare coordinated I'm by the- saying it's false. I did not dispatch Mr. Colangelo anywhere. Well, do you know how he ended up there? I assume he spoke, uh, he applied for a job there and got the job. But see, you know I what? I tell you, know you I had nothing to do with it. Well, you might not have had anything to do with it, but we've got this contemporaneous evidence in Mr. Pomerantz's book. So Pomerantz writes this book, which I'm sure you're aware of, where he says, we put together the legal eagles to get Trump. We got all these folks together and we assembled them for that purpose. And so when, when we on the Judiciary Committee think about attacks on the judicial process, our concern is that you, the, the facts and the law aren't being followed. A target is acquired here, Trump, and then you assemble the legal talent from DOJ, Mr. Pomerantz, and you bring everybody in to get him. I, I really, I, 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 and meanwhile, the judge is making money on it. The I, judge is making money on it. The judge's family is making money on it for stuff that you yourself wouldn't do. You know? All right, and, and just in case you missed it, when he mentions Mr. Coangelo and, and Merrick Garland here saying, I didn't dispatch him, I didn't dispatch him. Uh, you notice the one thing he objects to. I didn't have anything to do with it. My fingerprints aren't on it. You can't prove a damn thing, you crook. Mr. Colangelo was an assistant attorney general at the federal level in the Justice Department. He left that job to go take a job as an assistant DA in the city of Manhattan. Nobody does that. Nobody does that. Nobody in the history of mankind does that. You, you try to move from an assistant DA job up to the federal level and up to the DOJ. You don't go in the other direction. And suddenly he makes that move. He leaves the Justice Department after being appointed by this guy and by President Biden. He leaves. He goes to take this this, you know, uh, nothing job in the DA's office in Manhattan. And within less than a year, he's in the courtroom prosecuting Donald Trump. But Merrick Garland had nothing to do with it. You can't prove it. I tell you, Kappa, you can't prove it. That's how, but that's the only thing that he's objecting to here. All right. Sorry, Kevin. You know, no one's going to buy this. No one's going to believe it. It's going to create great disruption. And I am saddened by it because like you, I have given my life to the law. I care deeply about the law. And I think that the lawfare we've seen against President Trump will do great damage well beyond our time in public service. I see my time's expired. I yield back. Ranking members recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Attorney General, do you want to respond uh, to anything in Mr. Gates's tirade? Oh, that's very cool, though. I got to say, it's really cool that they let the penguin from Gotham City show up and ask some questions there on the dais. That's good for him. Ah, ah, ah. I think everything he was talking about was in a case in another jurisdiction, an independent prosecutor, Mr. Pomerantz, uh, worked for that independent prosecutor. I don't know Mr. Pomerantz. I don't know what's in his book, but uh, 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 these are decisions made in another office independent of the Justice Department. There you go. Well, listen, I am satisfied. I don't know about you, but I'm satisfied. No corruption here. Everything's fine. Look the other way. And don't you dare, don't you dare suggest that there's anything wrong with any of this, because if you do, you're guilty of a conspiracy theory and you're undermining the legal and judicial system in this country. You're the one who's undermining it. Not these guys. Got it? Great. You may have heard that Joe Biden suddenly discovered today that he is president of the United States. And as president of the United States, he can take executive action to fix problems. 
caused by Joe Biden. Of course, I'm speaking of the border and the incredibly insecure, outrageous, chaotic debacle that's been occurring for the last three and a half years on our southern border with Joe Biden's fingerprints all over them. I mean, he literally walked into office on day one and signed over 100 executive orders undoing what Donald Trump had done. When he walked into office, the border was secure. We did have some illegal crossings, but most of the people who were claiming asylum, false claims of asylum, by the way, for the most part, but they get to have their hearing, uh, they were applying in Mexico with the remain in Mexico policy, or they were applying for asylum from their home country, and we weren't having millions of people flooding across our border. Joe Biden, with the stroke of his pen, undid all of that. We've had the chaotic, insecure, dangerous situation at our border ever since. And today, today he signed an executive order that, well, does a little bit. It's a Band-Aid on a, a hemorrhaging, broken Hoover Dam. But Senator John Kennedy of Louisiana took the podium in the briefing room on Capitol Hill, and he had a thing or two to say about it. And whenever John Kennedy speaks, we listen. Okay, I want you to listen up. Here's the, here's the drill. Uh, President Biden is in trouble politically. Um, he's polling right up there with fungal infections. Part of the reason for that is that he gave in to the loon wing of his party and he dissolved the southern border. Now, five months before an election, he has to appear to be willing to do something about it, hence this executive order. And he expects you to uh, report this epiphany that he has had, take what the White House is, uh, is telling you, balance it on your noses like trained seals and report it uncritically. For five, for, for, for three years, we have watched President Biden push on a door that has clearly marked, has been clearly marked pull. He's mismanaged Congress, COVID, the national debt, the economy, inflation, crime, Afghanistan, Iran, uh, the war in Gaza, the war in Ukraine, and now, of course, the border. And every time, I think the president has hit rock bottom. He has managed to find a shovel and continue to dig. Hence, this executive order. And I think that's what the American people See, the first question I would ask President Biden is this. It's a little late, isn't it, Mr. President? It's a little late. Um, you can't make this cat walk backwards. The president's border policies have allowed 8 million people to come into our country illegally. If you try to come into our country today legally, you are a sucker. You are a sucker. All you have to do is present yourself at the southern border. Now, for three years, President Biden told us all, there is no crisis at the southern border for reasons clearly stated on the teleprompter. And his plan to deal with the crisis at the border was to pretend that there wasn't a crisis at the border. Some of you reported that. Some of you didn't. Well, when the American people figured it out, because they may be poorer under President Biden, but they're not stupid, the Biden administration shifted strategy. It then said, well, we know there's a crisis at the border, but we don't have any authority to fix it. That didn't work either, because the American people aren't cell deep stupid. So now he has decided to tell you that he has been born again. He has had an epiphany. He is now a border hawk. And that's what he wants you to report. 
Look, you can cut the hypocrisy with a knife. You know, I, I have seen the good side of politics, but I've also seen the dark side. I spent 25 years in the major leagues of Louisiana politics before I was sent down to the minors here in Washington. I have seen the good side, but I've seen the dark side. And this is the most one of the most cynical things that I have ever seen a politician attempt to do five months before an election. It is insulting. It is cheap. It is contemptuous. And the American people see that. And I, I hope uh, I hope you do, too. That, I mean, I, I am in awe of this man every time he starts to speak. Uh, it's no wonder that he belongs to the Gryffindor house. As is evident from his tie. Uh, you're not going to see that clip on cable news or most other streaming agencies. You'll see it here at Town Hall. We've got it. We're highlighting it. We're featuring it because my God, that was a masterclass, and it was so well said. And I want to, I want to go through some of the details here. I'm not going to do a Larry on his clip because the clip is perfect and beautiful, and that's why I didn't interrupt it because he's just that good. I would like to clone this man and make him every Republican elected official from top to bottom in this nation. And one of the reasons why it's so good is it, is it completely enveloped, entwined, and coded from top to bottom in the truth, in fact. And he directed it at his audience in that room, the media. The origin story of what happened today with Joe Biden's executive action on the border begins with Joe Biden denying that he ever needed to take any action on the border because everything at the border was great. You know, sadly, too many Republicans are going to jump on cable news tonight and say, oh, well, first he said he couldn't take executive action. Now he says he does. No, no, no. That's not where this begins. This begins with the lie that the border is not a crisis. We had to endure that for two years. Between himself, between his border czar, Kamala Harris, and of course, Secretary Mayorkas, the impeached Secretary of Health and Human Services, excuse me, from Homeland Security, who claimed that the border was functionally and operationally secure right up until five months ago when the calendar shifted to 2024 and they realized, oh, election day is coming. We better start attempting to acknowledge the reality of what's going on. So all of this first began with Joe Biden lying to the American people, saying that there was no problem at the border. Now, I've seen some commentary in the live chat at Rumble about what this new executive action allows in at the border before the president can secure the border unilaterally. Uh, El Capitan Beefheart asks, is it 1500 a day? Um, SMQB says that it was 39.99 a day, the 4,000 limit. I can understand why you're confused about this. Let me lay it out. The answer, by the way, in the executive action that Joe Biden signed today, is that now the president of the United States can shut off anybody coming in the border if border crossings reach 2,500 a day. That's the number. Not 4,000, not 1,500. It's 2,500. Now, there's some things about that number you need to know. First of all, 2,500 a day for a year is just under a million people. Just under a million people. Jay Johnson, the former Secretary of Homeland Security, not under Donald Trump, under Barack Obama, said that when you have daily illegal crossings of 1,000 a day, it's utter chaos and uncontrollable. This new executive action from Joe Biden today moves the threshold to 2,500. But the confusion with our great and brilliant and very funny live chat audience members over at Rumble about the 4,000 number, it's understandable that you're confused because the bill that Chuck Schumer and the Democrats and the Biden administration tried to cram down Republicans' throats just six months ago had that number at 4,000. Now, this is the bill that everybody's pointing to in the media or in the Biden campaign. I can understand why you would be confused between those two entities. 
because they do seem like they're working together. That bill is the thing that they all point to to say, well, we could have solved this problem with this bill, but Donald Trump told his Republicans in the Senate to block the bill that had been negotiated. So now if we've got a crisis, it's really it's Trump's fault because he wanted the campaign issue. Right? You've heard that all the time. They've been repeating that lie. And in that bill, the number of crossings that were allowable on a daily basis, illegally at our border, was set at 4,000. Now I repeat, Joe Biden's executive order today has the number at 2,500. In other words, well, I don't even have to use other words. It's obvious on the face of it. Even Joe Biden thinks that that piece of dog excrement that they were trying to push through six months ago that had the limit at 4,000 was completely unworkable and unsustainable. Otherwise, he would have made the limit today at 4,000. This is the bill that Democrats forced down uh, Congressman uh, Senator Lankford and other Republicans' throats in this ridiculous negotiation. I don't know why Republicans ever believe the Democrats are negotiating good faith when it comes to the border, because they never are. They never are. They never will, not since 87 when they lied to Ronald Reagan. They convinced Ronald Reagan that if they he just get a one-time amnesty for everyone in the country illegally, no more deportations, everyone gets citizenship, and then we'll lock down the border and we'll have no more illegal crossings because we're going to get serious about border security. And Ronald Reagan reluctantly went along with it because too many Republicans convinced him to. They lied then. They lie now. They will lie in the future. They have one goal open borders, and everyone gets to vote, cheap labor for everyone, undermining American jobs, putting a strain on the American social network that we've created here that's already strained enough. That's what they want. And anything that they claim otherwise is a total lie. So this bill that they tried to cram down that had 4,000 at the limit, even Joe Biden today, cut that number down to 2,500, which by the way is still too high, it should be zero. How many illegal crossings should we allow every day until we secure the border? Let's make it 2,500. Wait, hey, I've got an idea. Let's make it zero. Let's not allow any illegal crossings. You know why? And I know this is going to seem weird, but work with me on this. I think we should have the number of illegal crossings at our border zero because it's illegal. And we're lawmakers. And we are elected officials who actually make laws for our government. And it seems kind of weird, doesn't it, for us to sort of create this whole window of opportunity for people to recklessly break the law to the tune of a million people a year, considering we're lawmakers? Again, I'm just sort of spitballing here. Seems to me, since we're lawmakers, we shouldn't be negotiating how many people we're going to allow to break the law before we say, all right, that's it. Now we're serious. So this was brilliant work, as usual, by Senator Kennedy, laying it out in plain speech so that everybody understands exactly what's going on. The executive order that Joe Biden first said wasn't needed, then said he couldn't do, and now he's actually done, actually doesn't do anything. Because I want to give you one more example of how bad this is, really quickly. And I'm going to use some Democrat language here, but it's important language that we conservatives should be able to adopt as well. It has to do with uh, compassion. It has to do with humanitarian uh, crisis. It has to do with deplorable conditions for human beings that don't deserve to be treated like this. When Donald Trump set up our new border security protocols that were in place as of the moment Joe Biden became president that weren't perfect, but they were a hell of a lot better than what we've got now and a hell of a lot better of what, than what he inherited. When Donald Trump set up those protocols, he had gone through a long and arduous process of working policies in place where that if somebody came to our border to apply for asylum, they would remain in Mexico. It was called, strangely enough, the remain in Mexico policy. Joe Biden threw that out. 
But the policy was that if you came to our border and you were turned away because you were asking for asylum, we did not let you in and claim asylum here so you could get lost in the ether and never found again. No, you remain in Mexico until your asylum hearing occurs. This had the effect of two things. First of all, fewer people came because they didn't want to be in Mexico uh, because they knew that, you know, they weren't going to get in. But number two, and frankly, even more importantly, the people who did come and got turned away, there was a protocol in place with an agreement with the Mexican government so that they would be taken care of. Uh, Donald Trump also has set up another policy, which is you can stay in your own country and apply for asylum. So you never have to make that trek, right? That meant that coyotes and human strugglers and people who deal with uh, sex traffickers and human trafficking and and drug mules were not benefiting from America's open borders, right? You can remain in your own country to apply for asylum, no more needing to pay somebody $10,000 to take you and sneak you across the border. You stay where you are. The drug lords don't get rich. The human traffickers don't get rich. Nobody gets exploited. Everything's going to be good. See, those are two very good humanitarian policies that the Trump administration instigated. Biden got rid of them. Biden killed them. Biden destroyed them and then opened the borders. It enriched the drug lords. It enriched the coyotes. It enriched the human smugglers and the traffickers, the sex traffickers. It exploited children and exploited women. It led to chaos. And now all he's done with this executive order is say, okay, if it reaches 2,500, we're going to shut it down. We're averaging over 4,000 a day right now, over 4,000 a day right now. So he could shut it down today. And ask yourself something. What happens to those people? And I know I'm a hard-hearted conservative. I shouldn't care, right? Screw them. They shouldn't have been coming here in the first place. Yeah, okay. But for the last three and a half years, the U.S. government, you may not agree with it, but the U.S. government has broadcast to the world, give us your poor, your tired, your huddled masses, just come on across the border. We'll take care of you. And now we shut it down. And all of those people who are desperate who are in bad shape, they have left their countries to come here, assuming because Joe Biden told them they could, that they'd get in, and now the gate's going to be closed. Where do they go exactly? What's that going to look like? This is going to be a chaotic nightmare. Now, it's not going to be on our side of the border, so I guess it's not our chaotic nightmare. But you know what? Unlike what a lot of people want to think, we conservatives, we do have a lot of compassion. We do have big hearts. We don't like to see people in despair. We don't like to see people exploited. We don't like to see people living in squalor as a result of Democrat policies. And Joe Biden, when he shuts the border down without having any remain in Mexico policy, without having any policy set up to help these people and accommodate them and take care of them because he has enticed them and lured them to come here, he is going to have blood on his hands. And it's disgusting. And it's wrong. And all of it is because he's trying to save his own pathetic political career. Joe Biden is an awful human being. And that's just scratching the surface. Donald Trump has joined TikTok. And I'm not quite sure how to feel about it. I don't like TikTok. TikTok is owned by the Communist Party of China. Now, I think the Trump campaign has said that because of the new divestment order from the federal government, uh, TikTok is no longer going to be owned by the Chinese government, and therefore they've had a different change of thought about it. I'm not so sure. I don't like TikTok for a lot of reasons, not just the commie ownership of it. But whether you like it or not, Donald Trump's campaign has, in fact, joined TikTok. Now, up until now, it's been Joe Biden's campaign that's been on TikTok, which, frankly, is even more hypocritical because Joe Biden's the guy who signed the law prohibiting the federal employees, military personnel from having a TikTok account because it was so dangerous. So while, while he's ordering the service members and federal employees to stay off TikTok, his campaign was benefiting from it. So there's a shock. Joe Biden's a lying hypocrite. Uh, he's been on, Joe Biden has, I think for about nine months on TikTok. And he's done well. He's got like 347,000 followers. Donald Trump's been on TikTok for a week and he's got, well, he's got, he's got 4 million followers. 
in a week. Now, like I said, say what you will about whether Donald Trump should be on TikTok or not. That might be a different conversation. But if you're looking at the results of whether there's any interest in either one of these two campaigns, it's not even close. But I do like the who's Biden following? They're following four people. I want to know who they're following. One of them's got to be like a Sesame Street thing or something. You know he watches cartoons. I'm guessing it's Dora the Explorer because he's woke. Uh, meanwhile, Trump is not following anyone, and he's got uh, 4 million followers. 4 million likes, by the way. Biden has been able to acquire 4.5 million likes in nine months. In one week, Trump have, has as many likes. That's that's an incredible side-by-side -side comparison there. Uh, if if the election were held on TikTok today, <laughs> I think we'd know who would win. Uh, that said, let's look at a little of the content that the Biden team has put forth. They created a TikTok video that, uh, well, does what Joe Biden has always done in his political career and really what Democrats do, which is prey on people's fears, smears an innocent person with the most horrific kind of exploitive uh, defamation uh, and divides us along racial lines. I mean, it's got Biden written all over it. Take a look at this video. Guys, you have to see this new report about Donald Trump. A producer on The Apprentice just came out and said that Donald Trump called a black contestant on his show this. And here's Donald Trump's own former assistant confirming that there's a tape of him saying it. I had an opportunity to go out in Los Angeles and sit down with the person who actually has a copy of the tape. And I heard his voice as clear as you and I are sitting You here. have heard the tape. I have heard Since the publication tape. of this book. Absolutely. So you know it exists. And I know it exists. Anyone notice a pattern here? This is the same man who called to execute innocent black men and spread racist lies about the first black president. Donald Trump is exactly who we all knew he was, a lifelong racist. Black voters kicked Donald Trump out of the White House in 2020, and we're gonna do it again this November. Wow, I mean, this is a really, really new approach for Democrats. They're calling a Republican racist. Gosh, that is inventive. You got to hand it to them. This is creative. This is groundbreaking. This is this is what they've been doing for 40 years, actually. And this is an old story, by the way, this whole N-word thing. Let me ask you that. No, and by the way, unlike the rest of the media, I'm not going to say one way or the other if I believe this tape exists. I have no idea. Nobody does. I know I'm not going to believe Omarosa as Chuck Todd credulously does. But let me ask you this. If this tape exists, is, is there is there any reason that you can think of as to why it hasn't been made public at this point on June 4th, 2024, nine years after Donald Trump came down the escalator, four years after he left office? almost eight years after he was elected president, through all of it, through the Russian uh, collusion hoax, through the Stormy Daniels thing, through the uh, all of it. And we still haven't seen this tape. We still haven't heard this audio. No, listen, again, I don't know. It might exist. And I have no doubt, given how desperate they are, that between now and election, we are all going to hear this tape. I am sure that we are. That doesn't mean it's real. We've all seen what they can do with AI and deep fakes and what have you, but it doesn't matter. Does anyone, does anyone believe that it exists and we have not heard it to this point at this date? But throw all of that aside for a moment. This is what the Biden campaign TikTok has been reduced to, this is how desperate they are to get black votes. Th this shows you how terrified they are right now. This shows you exactly how bad it is. Hey, guys, don't even think about voting for him. He used the N-word about 15 years ago backstage at The Apprentice. You know, like that thing Kanye says every three sentences. But here's a really remarkable aspect of this whole story. That guy 
Joe Biden, who runs that TikTok account, the president who's now resorting to this smear campaign based on an unverified story with only one person's public testimony verifying it, and it's Omarosa. That guy, Joe Biden, who's doing that? Well, we got him on tape when he was a senator. The bad comb over. And he's using the N-word. Playing in the basement said, quote, we already have a nigger mayor. We don't need any more nigger big shots. That's not a deep fake. That's not AI. That's Joe Biden, Senator of Delaware. Throwing it around. Pretty casually, by the way. Was, I don't use that word. If I were reading a transcript that had that word, and I had to read it out loud in a public setting like that, I would I would probably visually flinch, or I wouldn't even say the word, because I know the hateful history of it. Look how easy this is for him. Plan in the basement said, quote, we already have a nigger mayor, we don't need any more nigger big shots. Not a flinch, not a pause, not a hesitation, not a forgive my language, I'm just quoting here. Could have easily just said N-word. Why in a Senate committee hearing does he feel compelled to just casually throw it out there? Plan in the basement said, quote, we already have a nigger mayor. We don't need any more nigger big shots. Well, this is the guy who, in complaining about school busing in the 70s, he worried out loud that his boys would have to go to a school that was really just a, a racial jungle. Jungle is the word he is. Racial jungle. Thankfully, though, look at how good his son turned out. Hunter's a kid. Did we get an update on his federal criminal trial today? Nah, we'll have to wait for tomorrow on that. So while they tell you they're worried about Donald Trump being such a racist, because apparently when he was taping Apprentice uh, off camera, someone caught him saying the N-word allegedly. But here it is 10 years after he announced his candidacy and no one's ever actually heard this tape ever before. You know, it's sort of like they buried it with that picture of Barack Obama and Louis Farrakhan. The L.A. Times had that picture, a newspaper, and they buried that and didn't release it to the public until after Barack Obama had already left office because uh, the newspaper thought it would be too politically volatile. The newspaper. The L.A. Times had that picture, Barack Obama with Louis Farrakhan, the anti-Semite, you know him, the racist. Yeah, that guy. So I guess they're just burying this too because they think this will be too political. It, it might, it might, out of context, paint Donald Trump the wrong way. Sure, anybody believe that? Does anybody believe that this tape exists? We haven't heard it already. And again, I give you Senator Joe Biden. Plan in the basement said, quote, we already have a nigger mayor. We don't need any more nigger big shots. Why hasn't anyone asked him about this or challenged him on this? By the way, if you show this tape to Joe Biden, he'll say, oh, who's that handsome son of a gun? He looks familiar. Is that my cousin? Because, you know, his brain doesn't work. One other part of this story that is pretty fantastic. In fact, I think my favorite part of the story. Let's go back to TikTok. We're going to watch the video, but we're not really going to watch the video. What we're going to watch is a contemporaneous scroll of the comments from TikTok viewers who are responding to the race baiting from the Biden campaign. Take a look at this. It's fantastic. Can't wait to afford a house. Why is my rent expensive? I can't afford eggs. Why is my gas so expensive? Why are my groceries expensive? Why is my gas expensive? Then 3.2 million. That's the number of followers Trump has. Why are groceries expensive? We're broke. AI can do anything now. 3.4 million. 3.3 million. Reaching 3.2 million. Why is my gas expensive? Who is she? 3.2 million. Why does Biden have red eyes? Oh, that's from the picture. Four million now. My groceries are expensive. I want to buy a house, but the rates are too high. 3.7 million in one day. Why can't my parents afford a house? Why is my gas expensive? Why can't I find a job? What app is this? Where's the, well, where is the tap? I don't know what that is. Uh, 3.6 million. Uh, we're going to keep going. Uh, he gets to 5 million, as you know, or no, 4.4 million. There we go. That's where we get to. Why don't they post it? That's a good question. Why don't they post the video that they claim they have? 
Why are my gas station expensive? Why? I love this. Why is my gas $80 a tank? Honestly, that should be the response to everyone who makes any accusation against Donald Trump or you or any Republican. It should be your response on your Facebook page to anybody who posts something about Donald Trump trying to slime him and slander him. Just say, why is gas so expensive? Why are interest rates so high? Why are eggs three times what they were? Why are my groceries so expensive? Look at all the, the crying emojis, all the clown face emojis. Why is a cup of coffee $8? By the way, I love all the people who are commenting saying, why are, is my parents gas so high? You know, because TikTok is for 14-year-olds. They don't vote unless they're Democrats and they're in the country illegally. But even the kids are calling out. Look at the comments. And there, there's like nobody in there that says, yeah, that's right. Trump is racist. I mean, nobody. Oh, the Russian might have. Trump for president. Post the video. You won't because it didn't happen. More pandering. <laughs> it sucks. Of course, they don't show any proof. Biden is more racist than Trump. Trump for president. I think Trump's going to win this November. Trump 100. This looks like the comment section on our videos. I love it. I love this country. Honestly, now that I think about it, I think it's a great thing that Donald Trump is on TikTok. If this is going to be the result every time, it just keeps going. There's another four minutes of this. Look at the comments. Look at it. It's fantastic. It's beautiful. It's a work of art. And by the way, in case you missed it, Joe Biden said the N-word out loud during a Senate hearing without flinching. It's on C-SPAN. We have the video. Why don't you share it with somebody? Someone who thinks Trump is racist. Share this video with them. I mean, it's not going to change their mind. But it'll be fun to see the reaction. That is it for this time. We will be back next time. And in the meantime, I'm Larry O'Connor. You can call me Larry. Larry.